I begin this morning lighting the Christ candle. May the light of Christ be with us, drawing us together wherever we are, making us one with all who seek God across the world. Let us pray. God of resurrection, we come to you as people who live in a broken world. We come to you longing for wholeness. We come as people with fractured lives, longing for new life. We come as people who have known your blessing, who know your goodness, but who cannot see beyond the world as we know it to the vision you promise. Help us to live in the light of the resurrection, to live with hope and confidence, to live each day the promise of life. Amen. As we get further from Easter Sunday, we get deeper into the reality of living the resurrection. It's no longer a surprise to absorb, but a way of life that transforms the ordinary, a promise that changes the way things are into the way that God dreams. And that's hard I'm going to read a passage that's written by the disciple Peter um, a long way along his journey so that Peter knows this. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying a, in Zion a, cor, a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. Called Simon by his parents, the fisherman was renamed Cephas, which is an Aramaic word that means rock. As he traveled outside Israel, Simon, called Cephas, took the Greek name Petros, so that those who met him would know that he had been named a rock. Being renamed by Jesus reshaped the man we know as Peter, shaped his identity and his understanding. And we see this in that passage that I just read. And based on the images that Peter uses here, I'm going to think about what a Galilean fisherman named Simon, who became Cephas and Petros, what it meant to be a leader um, who followed Jesus and the nature of the people that Jesus intended. That rock will become the image that's used because it's used throughout this passage. Going to the temple in Jerusalem, Peter would have been in awe of rocks and what rocks could do. The temple was built to create awe. High in the center of the city, it towered over every other building. Majestic stone walls made any person small in comparison. The beauty of the carving would amaze. Approaching the stone structure, it was easy to see that it was the home of a God of power and might. 
Peter would look at that stone structure and know the distance between it and himself. The temple was majestic, built to awe people of wealth with the cost of ornamentation to humble the proud from any part of the world. Peter would feel humble in front of it. Any structure in his home area of Galilee would look tiny in comparison. He would feel he had nothing in common with even the stones that were part of this amazing holy building. Jesus could call him a rock, but he didn't feel like one when he looked at the temple. But on the last visit to Jerusalem, stepping out of that temple, when one of the other disciples commented on the majesty of the building, Jesus declared, it's all coming down. When he entered the city, he had gone directly to the temple and cleaned it out, ch chased the sellers and money changers. Jesus had showed that the people running worship in this majestic temple were not holy. And at the end of the week, he said that the whole beautiful structure was a sign of what was wrong with the religious and political hierarchies. So after the resurrection, as Peter went past this building, when he went into its courtyards, he would remember how Jesus saw this structure. He would know that he's not supposed to be this kind of rock. If he was to be the foundation of a new community, it wasn't supposed to be this building or the people who ran it. This temple had been built of stone long before. It was what it would always be. It wasn't growing. It was a dead monument. And Peter came to understand that the community to be formed around him was to be a living community, not the dead community that ran this dead temple. The community that Jesus wanted was not a majestic memorial, not a massive structure that proclaimed might and power. It was to be alive. Jesus was a living stone, and those who followed him were to be the same. So what do stones build? Stones in buildings are strong. They're solid. Jesus was and is the solid strength of the community, the kind of building block that can't be moved. And yet he's alive and those who follow him are to live. The people that Jesus, that Peter spoke to knew about stone structures. In all of the cities, there were temples and imperial buildings. The people could see what Peter talked about. They were to be that kind of strong, enduring, powerful building, but still different. They were to build structures of living stones. Now, stones are not alive, and Peter becomes quite poetic at this time, and if someone were to write in a poem, I would challenge the choice of image that they put in there. But Peter's not a poet, he's but he's making a point about something that he understands. He sees in the communities that he works with that there is change. And he sees in himself there has been growth and change. He has seen that the gathering of people around Jesus' message needs to be as strong as a rock, but it also needs to adapt and grow. Peter moves on to the role of stones in construction. There are the rocks that are the foundation. Now, these are crucial. Even now, the laying of a foundation is what keeps a house solid. So Peter was the foundation, no, sorry, not Peter. Though Peter was named the rock, it was Jesus who was the foundation stone for the ecclesia, the gathering of people around him. They're not building on Peter. He's one of the living stones in the construction. They're not building on Paul, though he called a lot into that gathering of living stones. For Peter, Jesus is the foundation stone. Now the fisherman Simon might have spoken of Jesus as the anchor, the one who kept the boat in place. But then he knew that the boat had to keep moving. 
So we might have talked of Jesus as the keel that kept them on track or the hull that kept them together. But that was the fisherman Simon. The apostle Peter talks about stones and knows that Jesus and his teaching are the foundation of what he has become. Looking at the temple, the foundation stones aren't visible. The corners of the walls are, and those are strong stones that carry not just the weight, but the stress of, a, of an angle. Jesus is the kind of cornerstone that can bear the weight of life's challenges and the stress of change in a challenging world. But the other thing about entering the temple is you can't help but notice the key stones. In an arched doorway, the stone at the center is the strength that keeps the opening present and open. I know a little bit about this because our farmhouse was built in 1886 and the windows, of course, were leaky when we were there. When we brought people in to replace the windows, they said it had to be a retrofit. I wanted them to take out the whole structure and put insulation behind them and replace the rotten wood, but they said they would not take out the wooden frame. It would be a new window inside the frame because yes, there were some rotten pieces to replace, but the framing was structural for the whole wall. Sure, the top of the outside wall was slightly arched, but the opening wasn't built with a proper keystone. It needed the frame to keep the stones in place. The thing about a stone wall is it depends on every stone. You may be able to pull one out and keep the hole, but touch the wrong one and the hole tumbles. Peter had learned that the community gathered around Jesus needed each other. And despite his disagreements with Paul from time to time, the community needed that apostle too. In each city, they ne needed everyone who had come into the community. Peter says that they'd become a people around Jesus. They have a new identity and a new life in this gathering whose foundation was Jesus, but which is held together by the keystone, which is also Jesus. They've been drawn to Jesus um, by those who taught his ways. They've come from different families and different uh, cultural backgrounds. They're brought together with their differences. So to be one people, they need Jesus as the foundation stone, Jesus as the cornerstone that holds the weight and the stress, Jesus as the keystone that keeps them together. There was another reference to stones in this passage that draws from Peter's own religious traditions, and it does fit with what he knows about Jesus. On a smooth path, a rock will catch the foot of a walker and trip them up. And many found Jesus' story impossible, especially within Peter's own community. His death as a traitor to the empire made him impossible to follow for some in the empire. His condemnation by the hierarchy of Israel made him an outcast, not a leader. Some could not get by how he was seen by the leadership of their day to hear his message. They might like Peter and Paul, but they couldn't get past Jesus. They might hear the straightforward passion of those who had come to follow Jesus, but the one that they spoke of, they could not understand. The reality of Jesus' life was a rough stone in the middle of a smooth path, and some tripped over him. Although the two kinds of rock that Peter talks about are very different, they're still connected. For the people of Jerusalem, it's tempting to think of the new building that they're part of as a new kind of majestic temple. For the people of the cities of the empire, the stone buildings they know are impressive and beautiful. And 
they will in time think that they need to build buildings just as impressive as the old empire in this new one that does follow Jesus. And it is possible for people to become like a dead structure. The temptation to become an impressive building was a temptation, and it's continued to be a temptation. Think of all the impressive stone churches that have been built over the centuries. The gathered people of God kept building majestic structures that awe and impress. But visit many of those awesome structures in modern times. Too many are empty. They continue to draw people in to admire the structure, the art. And they do inspire something. But the people of the church are called to be living stones, to be alive, not to be majestic structures to be awed at. The people are called to live Jesus' way. We are called to be the stones that support others to become part of this building, to live well in this building. We're called to be living stones. In this moment of time, we are learning to be God's people outside the church. We do long to get back inside, and it will be good to be back together again, to be gathered as the gathered people of God. But as we are, we are the people of God. We can live that message. We can share the love of God where we are and as we are. So while we hope to get back to normal, it's worth taking time to consider in this time what it means to be the living people of God, building the world that God intends as we are and where we are. Let us pray. O oh God, we do not feel like gathered people in these days. We feel helpless to do many of the things that we know need doing in this time. There are people we long to care for that we cannot reach. There are needs in our loved ones that we cannot seem to address with the limits of this time. We pray that you will hold close those that we cannot reach that you will wait beside those we cannot comfort, that you will shelter those we cannot protect. There are people who are very much on our minds at this time because of illness, because of difficult times, because of grief. We place them in your hands, trusting in your presence to shield them, to strengthen them, to love and care for them. We pray for the vulnerable in our world. We think of people in shared accommodation, in shelters, in crowded spaces. People who cannot find space to think, space to keep safe. We pray for all who have lost income and are afraid they will not recover. We think of communities that are struggling. Help us to reach out with hope and with aid. Help us to understand. Help us to look beyond ourselves with love and care. O oh God, we pray for work that has been postponed, for urgent tasks that are waiting for attention. This one issue has taken all our attention for good reason, but other things are waiting to be attended to. You see the world as it can be, as it should be. You see the tasks that we need to take on. Help us to continue to dream of what is good and what is new as we work through each day. Creator God, help us to see what is in this world, the challenges and the blessings. 
help us to see the good that is straining to become. We appreciate the daffodils, the trilliums, the buds ready to burst to life. We're grateful for the gifts of each day, gifts of companionship and goodness. But help us to see as well the deeper yearnings of creation and of your people, and to be grateful for the river of life that flows deep in this world, seeking you and seeking your dream. Help us to see the life of your Son, Jesus, present in our time and in this place, seeking your way. Amen. Grab hold of the vision of God alive in the resurrected Jesus, alive in God's world, alive in you and in me. Let God's dream pull you forward into life, even if it is not the life you have planned, the life you imagined. Step forward to be the people of God, to become the people of God and build the living structure that God intends. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen. Peace be with you, and we'll talk again. <laughs>